This is The Denial of the Will and Denial of Hope, Schopenhauer's Philosophy in the Plays of Eugene O'Neill. In 1818, notoriously cynical philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer published his masterwork, The World is Will and Representation. Among the ideas in this work is the concept of, of denial of the will, the idea that to escape suffering, one must, es one must escape the inner drive of life. In 1918, 100 years later, Eugene O'Neill, the father of American drama, published Beyond the Horizon, which would earn for him his first Pulitzer Prize. In this three-act play, the ill-fated Mayo family suffers ever worse for their hopes of a better life, and their only relief comes, to, comes with denying their hopes and accepting death. These themes, denying the will and denying hope, seem to parallel each other, and with my research I've explored their connection. Eugene O'Neill's work, from his earlier one-act plays straight through to the major full-length plays for which he's most famous, show an undeniable focus on the theme of self-deception and false hopes. The hopeless hope that Stephen Murray grieves about in The Straw, the pipe dreams Hickey tries to tear Harry Hope's patrons away from in The Iceman Cometh, or the fetal fantasies of ever making it back home for the sailors in the SS Glencairn series. O'Neill is nothing short of obsessed with false hopes. O'Neill's conclusion, conclusions about false hopes aren't as consistent, though. The attitude taken towards self-deception in one play might be entirely contradicted in the next. For example, in Beyond the Horizon, the Mayo family's tragedy, fueled by their false hopes until resignation brings them peace, seems like a conclusive argument that to maintain false hopes is to doom oneself to decay. Within a year of that, O'Neill published The Straw, in which false hopes are the closest thing to salvation that Murray and Eileen reach. And in fact, it's losing hope that causes their downfall. Understanding O'Neill's dilemma here may hinge on understanding the ways he was influenced by the philosophy of Arthur Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer's theory of salvation through the will, uh, through denial of the will, can be seen as the inspiration and mold for O'Neill's theme of denying hope bringing salvation or damnation. Though the ideas are not identical, it can be seen that one follows from the other. Uh, it's the, the intent of my research to show that O'Neill's writing is absorbed in concepts he derived from Schopenhauer. Uh, in this presentation, I will be discussing the connection with Beyond the Horizon specifically. Uh, first, it must be established that O'Neill was in fact familiar with Schopenhauer uh, at the time he wrote Beyond. Arthur and Barbara Gale's biography, O'Neill, Life with Monte Cristo, uh, relates that in the summer of 1906, O'Neill read Schopenhauer in the library of Dr. Joseph Ganey, whose apartment was a hangout for O'Neill. O'Neill didn't merely read Schopenhauer, however. Um, it's clear he was influenced to some degree as well. In her essay, Strange and in Schopenhauer, Doris M. Alexander argues um, that O'Neill's knowledge of Schopenhauer is, quote, clearly indicated by the pervasive and consistent presence of the Schopenhauer of Beltenschauen in Strange Interlude, unquote. William Arbor Shear's follow-up to Alexander, an essay titled O'Neill's Schopenhauer Interlude, expands upon the argument with further evidence of the pervading Schopenhauer influence. However, both Alexander and Brashear focus solely on evidence in the play Strange Interlude, and Brashear even says the influence of Schopenhauer seems to be rather much confined to this brief interlude in his life, into this one play. They apparently underestimate the lasting effect reading Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer had on O'Neill, perhaps because O'Neill's response to Schopenhauer was so inconsistent. Uh, though it is an inaccurate oversimplification, for the purposes of this research, it's effective to explain Schopenhauer's concept of the will as the underlying force of existence and existence in itself. Uh, Schopenhauer's metaphysical system goes much deeper than this, uh, but as it relates to human action, the will is the drive that motivates. It supersedes the intellect in controlling every motive of human action, Though to say controls is less accurate than to say it is itself the motives and the actions. Um, the will is goalless, it has no ultimate purpose, but instead blindly strives toward life. Um, Schopenhauer's metaphor shows the will at work, um, blindly guiding action. Uh, quote, the one-year-old bird has no notion of the eggs for which it builds a nest. The young spider has no idea of the prey for which it spins a web, unquote. And Schopenhauer extends this to humans. Thus human lives become a program of continual striving, unable to be satisfied. Uh, Schopenhauer says of the will, its desires are unlimited, its claims inexhaustible, and every satisfied desire gives birth to a new one. No possible satisfaction in the world could suffice to still its, to, to still its craving." Unquote. Uh, with, with this perpetual striving comes the basis for the suffering in life. Schopenhauer's will to life should not be confused with the general term, the will to live. Um, it isn't merely a desire to go on living, as living implies the individual and the will operates beyond the individual, but it is a push to existence in the whole. Uh, in this sense, the life that the will strives for is ultimately the propagation of the species. Uh, for this reason, Schopenhauer views sexuality as being of the utmost importance, describing it as the ultimate goal of almost all human effort. In fact, love and attraction may be the best example of how the will acts beyond and above the consciousness in directing human behavior. 
Schopenhauer says, all amorousness, uh, quote, all amorousness is rooted in the sexual impulse alone. The ultimate aim of all love affairs is actually more important than all other aims in man's life, and therefore it is quite worthy of the profound seriousness with which everyone pursues it. What is decided by it is nothing less than the composition of the next generation, unquote. Schopenhauer's focus on species and sexuality here makes him an appropriate precursor to both Darwin and Freud. Um, for Schopenhauer, one of the most important correlatives of the will acting toward the propagation of the species is that it does not act on behalf of the individual. Often the will implants an illusion in the individual that he is, work, that he is acting for his own good, when in fact he is destroying himself in service to the species. Here we see the core of Schopenhauer's cynicism. We live in a state of perpetually striving, without lasting satisfaction, in service to the will, uh, which is often con uh, contrary to our own well-being. Thus Schopenhauer concludes that, quote, Nothing else can be stated as the aim of our existence, except the knowledge that it would be better for us not to exist." <laughs> O'Neill's Beyond the Horizon clearly indicates his affinity uh, for Schopenhauer's ideas at the time the play was written. The courses of the characters' lives are determined by the lies they follow, often what Schopenhauer would describe as service to the will. And each demonstration of their will to life, their repeated grasping and false hopes, makes their continued descent only that much more crushing. The inciting event of the play is Robert and Ruth declaring their love for each other. Prior to this, Robert did not believe that Ruth was available to him, and so his desire was to leave the farm on his uncle's ship. Um, as Schopenhauer would see it, the will was pushing him to leave. He could not advance the species there. Uh, Robert confirms this when he finds out that Ruth loves him. His plans change entirely, and he yet again justifies the will, saying, I think love must have been the secret, the secret that called to me from over the world's room. Uh, considering Schopenhauer's view of love as the, an illusory tool of the will, Robert here is sacrificing his personal goals, getting away from the farm, in service to the will, staying with Ruth. We see here a strong connection between the will and hope as well. Robert reveals that Ruth's love was, quote, something I did not take into consideration previously because I hadn't dared to hope that such a happiness could ever come to me, unquote. Like the will, this hope brings Robert a striving need which he hadn't had to endure before it. Hope, like Schopenhauer's will, doesn't satisfy a need, but rather creates one, which can at best be fulfilled and will more likely bring suffering. And in an interesting role reversal, it's now Andrew, the son who had been happy to stay on the farm, who decides to leave, motivated by his own love for Ruth. It is now Andrew who sets sail to appease the will elsewhere. In Andrew's case, he embodies the spirit of the will in his perpetual striving. The completion of any goal can only lead to a greater goal, and thus Andrew represents the continual strain, the unremitting cycle of want and suffering that the will provides. The Mayo farm is not large enough, and, he, and it must be joined with the Atkins farm. Andrew even bitterly describes the farm as work with no purpose in sight, uh, despite it consuming his life. And when he returns from his trip, even the joined farm is too small, and he goes to Buenos Aires for even larger opportunities in the grain business, saying, quote, I want to get in on something big before I die, unquote. To what ends, Andrew never questions. It is always simply more. And even after success in grain, he is not content and risks it all in speculating until he has lost everything. This is why Robert calls Andrew the quote, the deepest died failure of us three, unquote. He is the only one to see success in the play, but as Schopenhauer would predict, success could never bring him satisfaction. Meanwhile, Robert was never a farmer. Only the self-deception of the will convinced him he could be, and the farm falls into decay. We see the suffering brought by his will when he cries, quote, oh, those cursed hills out there that I used to think promised me so much. How I've grown to hate the sight of them. They're like the walls of a narrow prison yard, unquote. And even more, his anger turns to false hope, as he imagines finally leaving the farm, before the pain of reality sets in once again. Uh, Robert and Ruth's marriage never brought them real happiness, nor did having their daughter marry. Their marriage, if love is the illusion of the will for sex, follows Schopenha Schopenhauer's statement that, be, uh, quote, because the passion rested on a delusion that presented as valuable for the individual what is of value only for the species, the deception is bound to vanish after the end of the species has been obtained. Contrary to expectation, the individual finds himself no happier than before. He notices that he has been the dupe of the will of the species." Unquote. Yet, as always, the Mayos continue to hope, and the hope drags them further down. Ruth, having ceased to love Robert, confesses to Andrew that she'd hoped having a child would fix things, saying, quote, I thought when Mary came it'd be different, and I'd love him, but it didn't happen that way, and I grew to hate him almost. Unquote. When Ruth and Robert realize they are incapable of maintaining the farm on their own, Andrew becomes their illusion of salvation. There's an appeal for hope that is often repeated throughout the play, that Andy will fix everything when he comes. Ruth even falls in love with Andrew, or the idea of salvation she imagines is coming. But Andrew never brings salvation to the Mayo farm, 
and having now to face their self deception crushes them. Now where the true essence of Schopenhauer's philosophy comes through and beyond the horizon is in their reactions to finally reaching the breaking point, the denial of hope. Schopenhauer, having described the ways in which the will causes the suffering of life, says that, quote, the will must be denied if salvation is to be attained from an existence like ours, unquote. Denial of the will, <clears throat> denial of the will can be simplified for the purposes of this presentation to a state in which the individual ceases to strive, ceases to acknowledge desire, and ceases to respond to the will. Uh, Schopenhauer, heavily influenced by Eastern religions, um, sees this as similar to Buddhist nirvana and the only real salvation attainable in life. Robert reaches this state in the conclusion of the play. Up until then, his hopes continue, and in fact they reach delirium as he raves about finally leaving the farm, even as tuberculosis consumes him. Telling Ruth, we'll make a new start, just you and I. Life owes us some happiness after what we've been through. It must, otherwise our suffering would be meaningless, and that is unthinkable." Unquote. And then his hopes fall and continue to be a source of nothing more than emptiness and pain. It isn't until he hears from the doctor that he's going to die that Robert finds peace. When Andrew protests that there must be a chance for survival, Robert simply replies, quote, why must there, unquote. He is relieved of the burdens of his life and confirms that this is favorable when he tells Andrew to, Andrew to stop hoping and says, quote, you mustn't feel sorry for me. Don't you see I'm happy at last, unquote. Robert's state fits Schopenhauer's description, quote, how blessed must be the life of the man whose will is silenced, who after many bitter struggles with his own nature has at last completely conquered. He now looks calmly and with a smile on the phantasmagoria of this world, which was once able to move and agonize even his mind." Unquote. Ruth, de Ruth denies her will earlier and even more convincingly. By the end of Act Two, she has lost her hope from Andrew uh, and salvation from Andrew, and she folds in on herself. She is described as having, quote, the stony lack of expression of one to whom nothing more can ever happen, whose capacity for emotion has been exa exhausted, unquote. Her behavior through the third act matches as she reacts with quiet indifference to the alternating outbursts of hope, anger, despair from Robert and accusations from Andrew. She tells Andrew, quote, there's a time comes when you don't mind anymore, anything, unquote. This statement, characteristic of her ultimate fate, is a near paraphrase of Schopenhauer describing the individual who has attained, has attained the denial of the will, saying, quote, nothing can distress him anymore, nothing can any longer move him, unquote. Ruth reaches this piece as Schopenhauer predicts, quote, in most cases, the will must be broken by the greatest personal suffering before its self-denial appears. We then see the man suddenly retire into himself after he is brought to the verge of despair. We see him know himself, change his whole nature, rise above himself and above all suffering, unquote. This is not a happy fate. Neither Schopenhauer nor O'Neill would allow that. But in a world of suffering, a lobotomized neutrality is as optimistic an ending as possible. With Ruth finally, quote, sinking back into that spent calm beyond the further troubling of any hope, unquote, in the last line of the play. Though he said it 100 years prior, Schopenhauer may as well have been describing beyond the horizon when he said, when he said quote, we see in tragedy the noblest men, after long conflict and suffering, finally renounce forever all the pleasures of life, or cheerfully and willingly give up life itself, unquote. Uh, my research this summer has covered more connections between Beyond the Horizon and Schopenhauer than I've discussed here. Um, there's more to be said about sexual motivations, gender roles, and aesthetic contemplation. Additionally, I looked at the connections with another of O'Neill's plays, The Straw, uh, which seems to refute O'Neill's points in Beyond the Horizon. Um, and I hope to continue this uh, research as a thesis project, including more of O'Neill's work, especially The Iceman Cometh and Long Day's Journey Tonight. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank ATP for funding my research, Kathy Frederick, and everyone in the OUR for their help this summer. Uh, Dr. Torta for her guidance in my proposal, and especially my mentor, Dr. Carson, uh, for being a part of this project since last summer and for agreeing to continue with it even further. Thank you.